Recently, a number of rides have made headlines for either lowering their height requirements or opening with a lower height requirement than previous versions of the same ride model. At first glance, this may seem controversial since height requirements are ultimately in place to keep riders safe. However, there's more to this topic than meets the eye, so today we'll be taking a deep dive into how these requirements are set and how they can change. To understand how height requirements are set, we first have to look at how they're created. Height requirements are initially established by a ride's manufacturer and then followed by the park where the ride is installed. However, there are instances where a park may choose to raise the height requirement beyond what the manufacturer sets. Manufacturers use height requirements to define the minimum size allowed for riders. These requirements are determined using international standards for amusement ride design, such as those set by ASTM F24 and ISO standards. In general, restraint designs are based on the dimensions of the average rider. These dimensions are usually derived from data sources like the CDC, which creates and continuously updates a growth chart tracking the average height and weight of children. This data is factored into restraint design. Ride manufacturers then perform a containment analysis that evaluates various possible scenarios to ensure that restraints work effectively for all riders. Restraints designed for riders under 48 inches tall include special considerations, such as not having more than a 4 inch 102 mm diameter opening anywhere when secured. The containment analysis considers factors like the average rider's dimensions, the expected forces of the ride, the angle at which the riders are seated, the restraint's ability to secure riders, and the points of contact between the riders and the restraints to determine their adequacy. This also includes classifying the ride into one of the five restraint areas, each with its own specific design requirements. I've made a specific video on this topic if you'd like to learn more about it. Ride manufacturers can enhance restraint security by adding features such as additional locking positions, dividers, seat bolsters, and more. These enhancements can increase access for smaller riders, but must be implemented tactfully, as they can also limit access for larger riders. All of these elements are compared to the human experience on the ride. For example, even if restraints can securely hold a 48-inch rider, the ride experience may be too extreme for such a small child, who could be as young as 4 or 5 years old in some cases. In those cases, the height requirement will be set higher, and this is often why a park may choose to raise it themselves. None of these factors exist in isolation. If a ride's restraints accommodate smaller riders, but the seats are steeply angled or highly exposed, the ride will likely receive a higher height requirement. Conversely, a ride with less restrictive restraints may have a lower height requirement if riders are seated in an enclosed or mostly enclosed space, where the risk of falling out of the restraint is much lower. Other factors considered include the potential for a smaller rider to be injured by a restraint itself, and whether a supervising companion is required for smaller riders. All of this is to demonstrate the significant amount of thought, planning, and design that goes into rides restraints and their associated height requirements. So how is it possible for height requirements to change after a ride is already built? Much like the process of setting an original requirement, several factors are involved. First, remember that height requirements are based on the average measurement of riders. As these averages shift over time, engineers may reevaluate a ride and determine that the height requirement should be adjusted, either raised or lowered. In some cases, physical changes are made to restraints to accommodate smaller riders. These modifications may not be noticeable to the average rider, but can make a significant difference in restraint effectiveness for smaller riders. Such changes can be applied to brand new rides, resulting in lower height requirements than older models, or they can be retrofitted onto existing rides. In other situations, testing may show that a ride previously believed to need a higher height requirement is actually suitable for smaller riders. Manufacturers always err on the side of caution, so there have been cases where an initially high height requirement is later lowered following further evaluation. The opposite can also happen. Requirements may be raised. In any case, height requirement changes must be approved by the ride's manufacturer, who are ultimately the experts on the ride itself and its design. Regardless of changes, it's important to always follow posted height restrictions. These requirements are established by the most knowledgeable individuals regarding the ride and are regularly assessed for effectiveness. Keep in mind that height is simply the most convenient way to gauge a rider's ability to participate, but other factors do play a role, even though they aren't always screened for. 
For instance, a rider who is 48 inches tall but very skinny may not be well suited for every attraction with that height requirement. It's also important to keep in mind that ride restraints are designed for all foreseeable ride conditions, including things like sudden stops. A rider who is just under the height requirement might be able to safely ride a ride under normal conditions, but could escape from the restraints and suffer serious injury or death if an unusual situation were to occur, such as a sudden stop. Ultimately, good judgment is essential when deciding if a smaller rider should board an attraction. This includes more than just following the posted height requirement. It also involves considering factors like, can the rider hold themselves in place without trying to escape? Will a supervising companion be present? And do they have the body dimensions appropriate for the ride? At its core, there's no justification for attempting to bypass a height requirement. Rides are heavy machinery and can be unpredictable. No one knows the ride better than its manufacturer, so posted height requirements should always be respected. That's a basic overview of how height requirements are set and changed. What other ride safety topics would you like to see covered in the future? If you're interested in learning more about ASTM standards for ride design and how they influence restraints, I've linked my previous videos in the description, along with several other useful resources on ride safety and design. As always, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.